Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that beautiful uh, special music. Isn't God beautiful? Amen. We want to uh, welcome each and every one of us here this evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, as you've been coming to our Daniel and Revelation seminar, which started this Monday, how many of us have been receiving a blessing every single night? Amen. By God's grace, I hope that the messages that are being shared is, is understood uh, clearly and, and that we can all understand what's going on in prophecy because how many of us have ever read prophecy before and uh, we think to ourselves, man, this is so hard and difficult to understand. I know I was just like you. Uh, I was some years ago, I, I remember reading Daniel and Revelation for the first time and I just remembered Man, why am I reading these two books? All I see is dragons and beasts and leopards and rams and goats. And what is all these animals and all these beasts doing? And so in my mind, I thought, man, there's no hope. But as I started to read Daniel and Revelation, I started to realize that prophecy is all about Jesus. Amen? Prophecy points us to Jesus. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, and the revelation of Antichrist. Does that, is that what the Bible says? No, it does not say Antichrist. The Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Meaning to say that revelation and prophecy all points to none other than Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Well, before we begin our message this evening... We're going to start off with our nightly quiz. And uh, so are you guys ready for the quiz? We're going to look at Daniel chapter 8. This is what was covered last night. And we have three prizes. And whoever's hand that I see first, um, if you can hop onto a mic over there, the, the mic will be passed around. You can give the answer. And if you're correct, you guys will get one of these prizes. By the way, it's a Bible marking prize. Um, there's a Bible verse with a, a verse on it, and it's, for, it's good for uh, bookmarking. All right, let's start off with the first question. You guys ready? By the way, if you already answered a question before, you are exempted from the quiz. You don't have to take the quiz. This is for those who did not answer our quiz questions. You guys ready? All right, question number one. Who does the large horn of the male goat represent? Who does the large horn of the male goat represent? Anyone? Huh? Who does the large horn of the male goat? Okay, I'll give you one more chance. The goat represents Greece. But who is the large horn, that first horn of Greece? King Alexander the Great. Good job. Remember horns? in prophecy represent king or kingdoms. Congratulations. All right, good job. So the answer to this one is the large horn represents the first king of Greece. That's King Alexander the Great. Horns in, in prophecy represent kings or kingdoms. All right, question number two. You guys ready? Question number two. Who does the prince of the hosts Represent. Who does the prince of the hosts represent? I see a hand. It represents Jesus. Is she correct? The prince of the hosts represents Jesus. She got it correct. According to Joshua 5.15, you can come and claim your prize. Good job. All right, moving on to our final 
Our third and final question for our quiz. You guys ready? All right, here's the third question. What army did Rome use to help her defeat God's people? What army did Rome use to help her defeat God's people? The state. Huh? The state. the state. Good job. All right. So Rome was used. Rome used the power of the state as its army. This is where church and state united in 538 AD and ruled until 1798. Congratulations. And this period from 538 to 1798 is known in, in history as the Dark Ages. Does that make sense, everyone? So what, is, what was the army that Rome used? The power of the state. Remember, church and state must mingle together in order for the papacy to rule. Church, a union of church and state. This is state representing the armies and church representing the church of Rome. All right. So before we begin our um, message this evening, why don't we pause for a short word of prayer and then we we'll go into our message. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. We want to thank you so much, Father, for allowing us to gather together to study Daniel and Revelation, but specifically tonight, Daniel chapter 9. And oh, Father, this, this message that we have tonight is a difficult message to preach, Father, but it is one of the most beautiful prophecies of all of Daniel and Revelation because it highlights Jesus. And so, Father in heaven, I pray that Jesus would be lifted up this evening, that you would hide me behind the cross, and that you would please send your Holy Spirit to be our true teacher, to be our true guide, that he may lead us and guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. Father, this is our desire. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Are you guys ready to study? Okay. We're going to look now at a breakdown of Daniel chapter 9, basically a simple outline. And here's the simple outline. When you read Daniel chapter 9, you can look at these things in two parts. Here's the two parts. The first part, the breakdown of Daniel 9, is Daniel's heartfelt prayer. Daniel's heartfelt prayer. The second part of Daniel chapter 9 is the 70 weeks prophecy. If you were to break down Daniel in just two things so that it could be simplified, you have Daniel's heartfelt prayer and the 70 weeks prophecy. Now we're going to go through, a uh, majority of what we're going to study is more on the 70 weeks prophecy. In fact, in the 70 weeks prophecy, there are only four to five verses that talk about this whole 70 weeks prophecy. But those four to five verses are packed with details and information and, and so much history that we need to understand more about the 70 weeks prophecy. And yes, don't get me wrong, Daniel's heartfelt prayer is very important. But we also must study the 70 weeks prophecy because it's also just as important. Can you say amen? All right. So the first thing we're going to look at is Daniel's heartfelt prayer. Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 through 19. If you have your Bibles, you can open them. If not, I'll put a, a few verses here on the screen so that we can follow along. All right, you guys ready to study? All right, here we go. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. The Bible says, in the first year of Darius, who is Darius, by the way? The king of, king of Persia, right? The Medes and the Persia. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans is another name for Babylon, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, what everyone, understood by the, the books, the number of the what everyone, years specified by the word of the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, through who again? Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations 
of Jerusalem. So what is Daniel here thinking about? What is Daniel talking about here? When he's talking about, he understood by the books, by the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord. In order for us to understand properly what Daniel is talking about, we need to understand first, what was he reading in the book of Jeremiah? Does that make sense? So in order for us to understand what Daniel is thinking, we need to understand J Jeremiah first. So let's go to the book of Jeremiah to see exactly what Daniel is talking about. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 9 to 13, it's re it reads here, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not, what everyone, heard my words. Did God's people listen to God's words? No. Because you did not have heard my words, behold, I, that's, that's the Lord, will send and take how many of the families? All the families of the north, that's referring to Babylon, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of what, everyone? The king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, that's Jerusalem, against its inhabitants and against these nations all around, and will utterly, what, everyone? Destroy them and make them, what? an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. It's basically, I'm going to destroy and kill all the people that is in this land of Jerusalem. Did that happen when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered or besieged Jerusalem? Did that happen? Yes. And in what year, if you guys remember, did King Nebuchadnezzar conquer Babylon? I mean, Jerusalem. It started in what year? In 605 BC, you guys remember that date? In 605 BC, that's when King Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and he besieged that city. You can read Daniel chapter 1 and look at verse 1 and 2. So we see that what, what, what Daniel is, is understanding in the books of Jeremiah is that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is coming to Jerusalem to destroy them. Does that make sense? Okay, so Daniel is thinking these things, and notice, as a result of this confusion, Daniel begins to cry out to God and to ask God for what, everyone? Forgiveness of sins, because he thinks that the 70 years got extended to how many years? To 2,300 year, years. So Daniel is kind of confused, and he's wondering, oh Lord, what have we done again? Oh, Lord, why am I, why am I thinking so, mu so much negative things? And when you look at Daniel and you look at his heartfelt prayer, you're going to see that he begins to confess his sins. He begins to admire and praise God. He begins afterwards, later on, he begins to intercede for Jerusalem because he thinks that this prophecy of the 70 years that is told in Jeremiah has been extended to 2,300 years. So, da so Daniel, he's kind of troubled, and he goes to his knees, and he begins to pray. And this is where we have Daniel's heartfelt prayer. The reason why he's praying is so that he could be right with God, intercede for Jerusalem, and have no sin against God himself. Because he knows that perhaps this prophecy, 70 years, could be extended to how many years, everyone? 2,300 years. Amen. Okay, so now we're going to move on. Now, in Jeremiah 25 and verse 10, it says, notice what it says here. And this whole land shall be a what, everyone? Desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for how many years? For 70 years. So Jeremiah is basically telling, uh, telling Daniel that for 70 years, Babylon will rule in, this, in Jerusalem. But after this 70 years, then God's people would return back to Jerusalem. Does that make sense, everyone? So why is Daniel praying? Why does he have this heartfelt prayer? Because he thinks 
that the prophecy of the 70 years in Jeremiah has been extended. Does that make sense, everyone? So now he begins to intercede for Jerusalem. Now let's move on to the 70 week prophecy. Now this prophecy is a very powerful prophecy, even though it's only, it only has four to five verses, it is packed with meaning, it is packed with history, and we're gonna let scripture uh, speak for itself. All right, let's look at verse 24. In Daniel 9, verse 24, let's read this together on the screen. Ready, go. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Well, before I go there, notice how many weeks are determined for your people? So basically, 70 weeks is another way of saying 490 years. Okay, how do we get that? Where do you get 490 years out of 70 weeks? Well, how many days in a week? Seven days in one week. What is 70 times seven? You get 490 years. Now, the way that we can understand this is by this prophetic timeline principle known as uh, a day for year principle. Here's what it is. One day in Bible prophecy is equal to how many literal years? one literal year the way we can know this is by looking at numbers chapter 14 verse 34 and ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. this only applies in prophecy now there are many times where people take this out of context and they'll say that whoa uh what about we use this uh we use this principle for something that's not prophetic and that's where people can get confused confused this prophetic timeline principle it can be only used for what everyone for bible prophecy if it's not bible prophecy it's not going to make sense but these are the verses that backs it up numbers 14 34 and ezekiel 4 and verse 6. okay so now now it's not just 70 weeks it's not just 490 days it's now 490 years now let's read this very carefully. 470 weeks or 490 years are determined for your people and for your holy city. What does the word determine mean? Does anybody know what the word determine means? It's an old English word that simply means to cut off. To cut off. To what everyone? Let's say that word again. Ready? One, two, three, go. Cut off. Now the question is, what were the 70 weeks of time prophecy cut off from? What was the 70 weeks prophecy cut off from? Correct. The 2,300 days. It had to be cut off from a bigger, larger time prophecy that happened before Daniel chapter 9. Does that make sense? So it was cut off from a larger and a longer time prophecy. But we need to ask this question now. Before Daniel 9, was there a larger and a longer time prophecy? Before Daniel chapter 9, was there a longer and, and, and larger time prophecy? Yes, where? Yes, in Daniel chapter 8, there was mentioned a 2,300 day prophecy. Now again, a day represents how many years? So it's not just a 2,300 day prophecy, it's a 2,300 year prophecy. So meaning to say, the 70 weeks prophecy is connected to the 2,300 day prophecy. How many of us are tracking so far? Does that make sense? Because the 70 weeks prophecy is cut off from the more larger 2,300 year prophecy. How many years is the 70 weeks prophecy again? 490, not days, but years. When you apply the day for year principle, the day becomes a year. Now, when you apply the day for year principle for the 2,300 days, what now does it become? 2,300 years. Which is more longer, 2,300 years or, or 490 years? 
Which one is longer? 2,300 years is way longer than 490 years. Does that make sense? In other words, the 70-week prophecy is going to be connected. It's going to be cut off from the 2,300-day prophecy. Therefore, the start of the 70 weeks begins the 2,300 days. How many of us are understanding so far? Amen? Okay, we're on track here. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it continues, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Here's a question. Who was the 70 weeks prophecy for? Who was it for? It says your people and your holy city. What does your people stand for? Who is, what does it mean, your people? Remember, God is giving the dream to Daniel, and he's saying 70 weeks are determined for your people. Who is Daniel's people? The Jews, the Israelites, right? The people in Jerusalem. He's saying that this 70 weeks prophecy is specific for the, Jew, the Jewish people and for your holy city. What was the holy city that the Jews lived in? It was Jerusalem. Good job, guys. Okay, so who was the 70 weeks prophecy for? The 70 weeks prophecy were for Daniel's people, the Jews, or you could say Israelites, and their holy city, which was, which is Jerusalem. All right, so far, so good. Now, what was the specific purpose of the 70 weeks prophecy? What was the specific purpose? Notice Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. It's going to give you a whole list here of what was the purpose. Notice what it says. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to, what everyone? Finish the transgression. What is transgression? Sin. It's, it's almost like sin. To make an end of what everyone? Sin. And then in the third one, to make reconciliation for what is iniquity, everyone? Sin. To bring in everlasting, what, everyone? Righteousness is the opposite of sin. And to seal up, what, everyone? Vision and prophecy and to anoint the who? The most holy. Now, I want you to take, to take a note at this list. This is the basic purpose for your people and the holy city, which is Jerusalem and the Jews or the Israelites. And their purpose during this 70 weeks or during this 490 years, their purpose was to, to stop sinning, basically. Does that make sense? Their purpose was to, stop, to make an end of sins, to finish the transgression, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. In other words, to be right with God. Now, the question that I'm going to ask you guys is, why? Why was this only for the Jewish people? Why was this for only the city of Jerusalem? Why Jerusalem? Why not the Gentiles? Why not uh, other nations? Why was it specific for the Jewish people or for the Israelites? Because, the reason why is because God knew that this, the Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which was the holy city, and the Jews and the Israelites, they were God's chosen people. They were what, everyone? God's chosen people to welcome the Messiah. In fact, look at this at the bottom right here. Their job was to anoint who, everyone? Who is the most holy? That's none other than Jesus. They were supposed to welcome the most holy and by God's grace, they were supposed to make right with God. They were supposed to cleanse their hearts of sin. They were supposed to remove any transgression that was keeping them from receiving Jesus when Jesus came to the scene. They were supposed to make reconciliation between their brother, between their neighbor, between their siblings. They were supposed to bring in everlasting righteousness. Everlasting righteousness, by the way, is, a, is referring to Jesus Christ. They were supposed to welcome Jesus. But it says in Matthew, it says in John as well, in John chapter 1, it says, Jesus came to his own 
and his own what, everyone? Received him not. Let me ask you this question now. Did the Jewish people, did the Israelites, did they follow this command? No. Why didn't they follow this command? Because they were in a rebellious spirit. They were basically, they were expecting the most holy. They were expecting Jesus to be a conquering king. Does that make sense, everyone? Because the Romans were in control of the Jews, of the Israelites. And they needed a king that would destroy Rome. They wanted an earthly king. And they saw that Jesus could have been that earthly king. But did, was Jesus that earthly king? No, he wasn't. Did Jesus destroy Rome physically? No, he didn't. So let me ask you this question. What was the purpose of the 70 weeks again? Basically to get rid of sin so that we could welcome Jesus. Does that make sense, everyone? Get rid of sin so that we could welcome in Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah. Now, in other words, the purpose of the 70 weeks prophecy was to prepare their what, everyone? Their hearts to meet their Messiah. Oh, brothers and sisters, how many, how many of us are preparing our hearts not for the first coming of Jesus, but for the second coming of Jesus? Amen? This is what the Jews were supposed to do. These were God's chosen people. They were supposed to be representing Jesus throughout their world. But they failed miserably. And as a result, when we look down later on in the 70 weeks prophecy, we're going to see that the gospel is not only given, is, is, is not only given to the Jews, it stops. The gospel is not is not going to be preached to the Jews, but it's going to be given to who, everyone? The Gentiles. Meaning to say the Jews had lost their probation. And now, let's give, let's give salvation to the Gentiles. Does that make sense, everyone? All right, we're going to move on. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, the Bible says, Now know therefore and understand that from what, everyone? From. I... I highlighted that word for a purpose. From the going forth of the command to restore and what, everyone? Build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, when you look at this verse, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, does this verse give us a starting point? What is the starting point? What is the key word? In fact, what two key words were used to discuss the timing of the start and end of the 70 weeks prophecy? What were those two words? The, you, the words that Daniel used was from and from and until. From and until. Now let's go back to this verse again. This is the starting point of the 70 weeks prophecy. Know therefore and understand. That from, this is the start point, from what? The going forth of the command to what, everyone? Restore and build. There are two things that happen at this from, at this from date. The two things that's going to happen is the command to restore and build what, everyone? Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? The holy city that the Jews lived in. Amen? Amen. In other words, restoration and rebuilding of the temple was going to happen, was going to take place in Jerusalem. But we have an issue. We have a problem here. The problem that we have here is that the Jews are where, everyone? They're in Babylon. You guys remember? What happened to King Nebuchadnezzar when he besieged the city? He took with him all the wise men. You guys remember that story? And who was part of those wise men? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These wise men and other men as well who were also Jews and Israelites came with them on their long journey marching all the way to Babylon. And they were being held captive. So this is a problem now. How are they going to go back and restore and build Jerusalem? How are they going to do this? 
we'll, we'll see later on. Notice, okay, so Daniel used the words from and until. Okay, question. From when did, from when then did the 70 weeks start? Does anybody know? It started from the command, or you could say decree, to restore and what everyone? Build Jerusalem. Now, we know this from scripture, but we need to know this from history. What date, what specific year did this command to, di to restore and build Jerusalem? Well, I'm going to give you certain uh, key dates and certain decrees. When was there a command or decree given to restore and build Jerusalem? Now, here's the, here's the decree. Here's the date. There are three decrees. How many decrees? There is actually a fourth decree, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, tonight. There is three major decrees. The first decree happened in 536 with the King Cyrus of Medo-Persia. This was the first decree, and in this first decree, you can read it in Ezra chapter 1 and 2 Chronicles chapter 36. In this first decree, Cyrus, King Cyrus, only gave permission to what everyone? To build the temple. Was that the command that, uh, that was given to Jerusalem? No, it was half of the command. It was part of the command, but it wasn't the full command. Because what was the two things that was needed to start the 70 weeks? To restore and to build. Now, there was a second decree, King Darius. King Darius is the king of Persia. Just like King Cyrus, he was the king of Persia. In this second decree, King Darius I gave a decree in 520 B.C., and you can read it in Ezra 6. In this second decree, Darius gave a decree renewing the decree given by Cyrus. So basically, the decree stayed the same. The, the decree never changed. The decree that King Darius uh, mentioned here in the second decree was only a repeat of the first decree by King Cyrus. Does that make sense, everyone? So did the first and second decree match up with the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? No, it did not. Now, look what we come to the third decree. The third decree, this is where it happens. In the third decree, King Artaxerxes, who's also the king of Medo-Persia, he actually, in 457, in the fall of 457, he writes a decree. And King Artaxerxes gave a decree to what, everyone? Restore and build Jerusalem. You can read that in Ezra 6 and Ezra 7. It was a command to restore Jerusalem, its political, its judicial, its religious, and also the physical nation itself. Does that make sense, everyone? When, when the Jews were held captive in Babylon, basically what was taken from them? What was taken from them? You have the political system taken away. You have the judicial system taken away. You have the religious system taken away and you have the nation taken away. They were all replaced with Babylonian religious, uh, religious programs, Babylon judicial programs, and Babylon political programs that they had in Babylon. Does that make sense? Meaning to say, when, when, when King Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem, he took, he stripped basically all these things that a nation has. And now the nation does have, doesn't have a leader, it does not have a king. It does not have judges. It does not have uh, religious people. It does not have the children of Levites, the, the Levites to protect the sanctuary. It does not have any political standing. It, there, there's no judges. There's no kings. There's no rulers. There's no princes. Basically, what you have here is Jerusalem is stripped of all its power. Does that make sense, everyone? But King Artaxerxes, he was the one that God impressed upon his heart to write a decree to restore and build Jerusalem. Basically, he was giving the Jews permission to go back to Jerusalem and to start to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Does that make sense, everyone? Amen. All right, so now we're going, we're going on. In Ezra chapter 9, I want to show you this verse real quick. It says, for we were what, everyone? This is what the Jews were going through. This is what uh, the Israelites were facing when they were in Babylon. Yet, our God did not, what, everyone? 
forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of who, everyone? Persia. To what, everyone? To revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. This is basically what they were going through, and this was good news. When King Artaxerxes gave that third decree, that command to go back to Jerusalem to restore and rebuild, this was how they felt. They were excited. They were joyful because they knew that God's kingdom would be restored and it would be repaired again. Can you say amen to that? So they went back, and you can read in the book of Haggai. I don't know. Have you guys ever heard of the book of Haggai? There's only two chapters in Haggai. In, in those two chapters, you're going to find that they start to build the temple, and then they get discouraged. They get discouraged, and, not, and as a result, they don't want to build the temple anymore, and they go to their own homes to try to build their own houses. And then God rebukes them through the prophet Haggai, and as a result, they begin to go back and to repair and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. So far, so good? Amen. Okay. So out of the three main decrees given, the decree given by who, everyone? Artaxerxes was the only decree which commanded Israel to return home to build and restore Jerusalem in what year, everyone? In 457 BC. Do we have a start date now for the 70 weeks prophecy? Yes, we do. When was the year that the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? 457 BC. That was the command uh, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Thus, 457 BC is the starting date of the 70 weeks and the 2300 day prophecy. Does that make sense, everyone? So here we see on this timeline, we have 457 BC. This is the start date of the 70 week prophecy. Okay, so now we're going to move on. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore, <clears throat> um, I want to skip down to here. To restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be how many weeks? Seven weeks and... I have a question. Why, doesn't, why didn't Daniel just say 69 weeks? Why did Daniel have to break up the 69 weeks and say, I want seven weeks here and I want 62 weeks here? Why did Daniel mention it like that? Does anybody have a guess? The reason why is because he wanted to show the difference between the from and the until. Does that make sense? The from was for what, for what two purposes? Restore and build Jerusalem. That was the from part. That took seven weeks. How many, how many days in a week? Seven days in a week. What's seven times seven? 490 490 years, I mean, sorry, 49 years. <laughs> now, the next question that we need to ask is, who is Messiah the Prince? Remember now, from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's the start date, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Who is the Messiah the Prince? The Messiah the Prince. No, notice what John chapter 1, verse 41. Let's actually read this together. This is beautiful verse. It says, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the what, everyone? The Christ. No, notice the next verse, John 4, 25. It says, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Who does the Messiah refer to, everyone? Jesus Christ. Now, who is the prince? Who is the Messiah, the prince? In Acts chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible is clear. It says here, let's read it together. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the what, everyone? The prince of life. Who is that referring to? That's Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Did, G did God raise Jesus from the dead? So then the Prince of Life represents none other than Jesus. 
Now the last verse here, Acts chapter 5. It says here, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to, the, to be what everyone? Prince and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Who is the Messiah? Jesus. Who is the Prince? It's Jesus. The Messiah, the Prince, is none other than Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now we have a next question. What does Messiah mean? What does the word Messiah mean? The word Messiah just simply means anointed or baptized. Was there ever a point in the life of Jesus that Jesus was anointed or baptized? Yes. What year did Jesus get baptized? Notice what it says here in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to look at um, the whole chapter of Luke uh, chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what year of the reign? The 15th year. And notice in this same context, in the same chapter, in Luke 3, verse 21 and 22, it says here, let's read it together. When all the people were, what everyone? Baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What year did Jesus come to earth to be baptized? Jesus was baptized in the year 27 AD. Amen? Jesus was baptized in exactly the year 27 AD. You can look it up in history. You can look it up in scripture. It all points to Jesus being baptized in this exact year. Now, According to history, this decree was sent out. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to go here. Okay. You remember, you remember the 70 weeks was broken down? Remember it said seven weeks and 62 weeks? Okay, we're going to look at the 62 weeks. 62 weeks later, which is 434 days, when you apply day for year, 434 years, would come to the 69th week where Messiah the Prince is anointed. Does that make sense, everyone? Now, the question is, when was Jesus anointed? When was he baptized? He was baptized in the year 27 AD. Now, we need to know, this is a note here, we need to add one more year to 26 because there is no zero year. Does that make sense, everyone? You can actually pull up the calculator and you can, you can calculate it. You add 457 minus 49, you'll come up to, um, sorry, minus 434, you'll come up to 26. All you have to do is just add one more year to 26 and you'll come up to 27 AD. Does that make sense? 27 AD in history and in scripture is the exact date that Jesus was baptized. Now, we're going to look at the last few verses and then we're done after the after the 62 weeks messiah shall be what everyone what does cut off mean it means that <laughs> cut off means determine but it also means death you can look in isaiah chapter 53 messiah was cut off he was cut off for his people it says, but not for himself. In other words, Messiah, Jesus, had died, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. What city are we talking about here, everyone? That's Jerusalem. What sanctuary are we talking about here, everyone? That's Jerusalem, the, the, the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Now, you're probably wondering, how in the world was the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? But now in this next verse, we see that there is a command to destroy the city, that's Jerusalem, and to destroy the sanctuary in it. Does anybody know why? Why was it in one, in one verse it says to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? And then in the next verse it says to destroy Jerusalem and to destroy the sanctuary. Why did this happen to God's people?
Does anybody know? Because they rejected Jesus. And in fact, in his, history tells us, in the year 70 A.D., what year, everyone? 70 A.D., Titus came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. You can look it up in history. The reason why the sanctuary was destroyed and the city was, was, was destroyed was simply because they rejected the Messiah and they wanted him dead. They did not accept Jesus into their heart. And as a result, now the prophecy turns on them and says, you know what? I want, you to, I want this city to be de destroyed and the sanctuary destroyed as well. Because you rejected Jesus, the Messiah. Does that make sense, everyone? The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. When you look up flood in, in scripture, a flood just simply means uh, an army or an attack, a, a surprise attack coming to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And when you look at history, Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus in the year 70 AD. And to the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the midst of the week, he shall bring an end of, to sacrifice and offering. Now, I want to show you something interesting. In what year was Jesus baptized and anointed? 27 AD. What year was Jesus crucified? In 31 AD, three and a half years after 27 AD. And in what year was now the gospel rejected by the Jews and now it's preached to the Gentiles? 34 AD. Do you guys know why the sanctuary, again, this is a question, I'm always asking this question. Why was Jerusalem destroyed and why was the sanctuary destroyed even though the command was to restore and build Jerusalem? Why? Because they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Jesus. As a result, because they rejected Jesus, now the gospel is being preached to who, everyone? The Gentiles. Meaning to say the Jews had their probation. They had their chance to, to accept Jesus as their Messiah, as their coming king. But because they rejected him, now the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. There's, there's so much more information I wish I could share, but there's so little time. Uh, I would like to go into a further Bible study later on in a future date. But I hope this makes sense. I hope that we're looking at all of these things. So let's quickly review what we studied. What year does the 70 weeks prophecy begin? 457 BC. In 457, there was a command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, 49, remember how it says seven weeks and 62 weeks? You guys remember that? That seven weeks or 49 years were for the, com were, were for the restoration and building of Jerusalem. And guess what year exactly did Jerusalem was restored and rebuilt. It was the year 408 BC. 408 BC took place 49 years exactly as prophecy had mentioned, 49 years after 457. You go 457 minus 49, you get 408 BC. So far, so good? Okay, now we're gonna look at the 62 weeks, basically from 408 BC to 27 AD, this was the time for the Jewish people to prepare their hearts to receive the Messiah who would come in what year, everyone? In 27 AD. In 27 AD, Jesus was baptized during that year. I know it's hard to see, but I'll give you guys the slides later on. From 27 AD, you have this last week or this seven years left. From 27 AD to 34, you have seven years and scripture tells us that in the midst of the week, the Messiah would be what everyone? Cut off. What does cut off mean again? He would die. Jesus was crucified in exactly the year 31 AD. That's what happened to Jesus. Now, after, after Jesus uh, had died in 31 AD, where did he go in 31 AD? Jesus went to heaven, right? What happened 
from 31 AD all the way to 34 AD. There's still, there's still about three and a half years left, which was for what, everyone? It was for the Jews. It was for the, the Jewish people. It was for God's people. Remember when Jesus, before Jesus left the earth, in Acts chapter 1, he said, I want you to start where? In Jerusalem. I want you to be witnesses for me where, everyone? In Jerusalem. And then you go out, you go to uh, Samaria, then you go out further and further and further and further and reach the whole world. But before the world was reached, Jesus wanted the apostles to reach out the Jews first because probation was still open for them. And it wasn't until 34 AD when Stephen was stoned. Who was stoned, everyone? When Stephen was stoned, that they rejected the Messiah and they rejected the gospel. As a result, the gospel was then preached to the Gentiles. So far, so good? Okay. We already covered this. Okay, so now we're going to look at the bigger scope of picture and then we'll close. This is pretty much my last slide. Okay, so here we're just recapping. It starts in 457 BC and it ends for the 70 weeks. It ends in what year, everyone? 34 AD. This is when the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. What year did Jesus die, everyone? 34 AD. What happened in AD 27? Jesus is anointed or baptized. What happened in 408 BC? The, the temple and Jerusalem was restored and finally rebuilt. What happened in 457 BC? The command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Does that make sense so far? But now we're left with this time period of 1,810 years. This completes the 2,300 days or 2,300 years. If you were to add 457 and then you were to minus 2,300 years, you'll get up to the point of 1843. You have to add one more year because there is no zero year. So you actually come out to what year, everyone? 1844. Do you, remember, do you guys remember in Daniel chapter 8? You remember the question? Until how long then the, the sanctuary shall be cleansed? Until 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Until 2,300 years. In other words, from this point on, from 457 BC all the way to 1844, they were to prepare their hearts for Jesus. They were to prepare their hearts for the gospel. But because they rejected the gospel, because they rejected Jesus, now God gives the, go the gospel now to the Gentiles. And for 1,810 years, this was the preaching of the gospel to the, to the Gentiles. So that the Gentiles now could have salvation. Does that make sense, everyone? But when you get to this period in 1844, this was the start date of what we know as the investigative judgment. As the what, everyone? What year did the investigative judgment start? In 1844. In 1844, specifically October 22nd, 1844. And what has happened in 1844? What, what happened in 1844 in heaven? According to Daniel chapter 7, the what were open? The books. Meaning to say, in 1844, the books of the record of our lives, of all our sins, of all our thoughts, of all our actions, of everything that we ever done in the past, not just for us, even for people back then in, in, the, like in Adam's time, all, all their records, all their books were open before God in 1844. This happened in heaven. And the purpose of this was to investigate. What was the purpose? To investigate, to see if their lives matched up with the God's word and God's law. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. So the question is, what are we supposed to do? We know what Jesus is doing in heaven, but what about us here on earth? In 1844, what should we have been doing since that time? 
we're living in the time of the investigative judgment. What are we supposed to do during this time? We're supposed to be doing what the Jews supposed to be doing here to welcome their Messiah, their Savior in, 30, in 27 AD. Does that make sense? Meaning to say, everything that happened in the past is going to be repeated in the future. God's people who were supposed to build the temple, who were supposed to allow Jesus to come inside their temple, who were supposed to receive Jesus as their Messiah, who were supposed to accept the death of Jesus, who were supposed to accept the coming of the first coming of Jesus, they were supposed to accept the Messiah. But how about us in the last days? when Jesus is coming the second time. What are we supposed to be doing since 1844? The exact same thing that happened in 457 all the way to 34 AD. They were supposed to prepare for Jesus. Are we preparing for Jesus' second coming? If you guys want to be ready for the second coming, if that is your desire, I ask that you please stand with me as we close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for this precious prophecy, Lord. And I know, Lord, we, didn't, we don't have that much time to study this in detail in one sermon. Father, I pray, Lord, that the message that was understood tonight, Lord, that it would be clear in our minds. Lord, the main point of the 70 weeks prophecy is Jesus. Not the dates, not what happens in between, not all these uh, verses that, that back up the decrees and everything, Father, but the main point of the 70 weeks is Jesus. Am I getting prepared for Jesus to come? Because we've seen in the past that the Jews had failed miserably. They ended up rejecting Jesus. But Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that, you, that you're giving us a chance. Since 1844, you've been giving us a second chance to get to know who Jesus is, to put away sin, to put away transgression, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to welcome the Messiah, to accept the death of Jesus so that Jesus could be our personal Savior. Father, that is the main point of, of Daniel 9. And Father in heaven, Perhaps some of us are not ready. Perhaps some of us don't know Jesus. Oh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a desire to get to know Jesus better, that we may be prepared for not your first coming, but your second coming in the end. Prepare us, Father, amidst this COVID-19. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful and meaningful message. Let us be ready to accept Jesus in our heart and for his second coming. So let us stand up and sing, I want to be ready when Jesus comes as our closing song. to be 